Good day and welcome to Reclamation History webinar series titled History of the Reclamation Engineering Laboratories 1930 to the Present Day. I am Andrew Gahan, manager of the Bureau of Reclamation's History Program. This is the sixth of a series of monthly events as we build a Reclamation's 120th anniversary on June 17th, 2022. This event is being recorded, and if you are not interested, please disconnect at this time. If you have any questions, please click on the question mark bubble on the upper right, horn, right hand corner of your screen, and we will do our best to answer any questions at the end of the presentation. Today, we are gonna look back at the history of Reclamation's laboratories. As some of our past presentations have indicated, Reclamation's engineering expertise has had a positive impact on Reclamation's mission, and its laboratories played a major role in that success. I am pleased to introduce Janet White, Chief, Chief of the Engineering and Laboratory Services Division in, in the TSC, to provide us a glimpse at the evolution of Reclamation's laboratories. So without further ado, Janet, the stage is yours. Well, thank you, Andy. Um, I'm excited to present to you about the Reclamation laboratories, but before I begin, I need to give Cindy Gray a special acknowledgement. She poured over the historical documentation that we had in the laboratory and created this slideshow presentation. This presentation would not have been possible without Cindy's talented skills and hard work. The history of Denver Reclamation Laboratories begins with the Reclamation Act signed by President Roosevelt in June of 1902. By July of 1902, the United States Reclamation Service was established within the U.S. Geological Survey. And in 1907, the Secretary of Interior separated the Reclamation Service from USGS creating the Bureau of Reclamation. The first Reclamation Laboratory was established in August of 1930 by taking over the laboratory established by Ralph Parshall in 1912 on the campus of Colorado's A&M College, now known as Colorado State University. 12 engineers, carpenters, and laborers moved up to Fort Collins and into the Colorado Agricultural Experimental Station. In 1931, Reclamation had plans to build a very large dam on the Colorado River. Originally named the Boulder Dam, this led Reclamation to establish a hydraulic laboratory for studying the many new problems they would face with designing and constructing a new structure. At 726 feet above bedrock, this would be the highest concrete dam in the Western Hemisphere. As a side note, after it was built, the name of the dam continued to have controversy until it was acknowledged that the Hoover Dam name was set in stone, or more appropriately, concrete. As noted, the magnitude of the Boulder Dam project and all of its related structures was motivation for reclamation to begin hydraulic modeling. This photo shows one of the spillway models at the Fort Collins Laboratory. Another reclamation laboratory in Colorado was the Montrose Field Laboratory. This laboratory evaluated the final design of the side channel spillway for the Boulder Dam study. The Montrose Lab also provided a model for the Imperial Dam and its related structures, and the final design of the Grand Coulee Spillway Bucket Study. Another and the spillways for Boulder Dam were one of the first opportunities for innovation by the laboratory staff. During the course of the late 1920s and early 1930s, designers had been busily trying to lay out the design and structure layout and design a structure required to pass water at a rate of 400,000 cubic feet per second with a fall of over 500 feet. The velocity of the water would reach 175 feet per second, which is, was considerably exceeding that of any other similar structure previously considered. The idea to somehow use a diversion tunnel or separate tunnels to convey the flows downstream was a design cornerstone. These models took the better part of two years of intensive work to complete. 
After all was said and done, a total of 11 models were tested, many of them with large numbers of variations. Reclamation has used tunnel spillways at many other structures, and they are still a viable alternative when designing a spillway today. The next reclamation laboratory was called the Custom House. This lab was established in the basement of the Denver building named the Old Custom House in 1934. The move was predicated on the need to be closer to the designers, so there could be more interaction between the laboratory staff and the design engineers. Many smaller scale models were studied here, and the Custom House Laboratory was operated only for three years until 1937. In 1937, a larger dedicated laboratory was built and called the New Custom House. The laboratory was located at the corner of, or the cross streets of 19th and Stout in Denver, Colorado. This is the floor plan of the New Custom House, this laboratory occupied an entire block in downtown, in downtown Denver. The concrete laboratory was the key component of the new custom house laboratory. Below the mixing room was a sub basement with space for storage and aggregate processing. The calorimeter room in the new custom house was adiabatically controlled, which enabled the testing of heat rise of concrete, which is an important design criteria for mass concrete. This photo shows the elaborate system of equipment and recorder thermometers, which maintain accurate and permanent records of the concrete heat rise test results. The, in the aggregate processing area was a freezing cabinet equipped with dry wells for the freezing of aggregate tests and wet wells for the freezing of concrete specimens, which were immersed in a special rubber boot. The concrete materials laboratory housed an impressive 4 million pound compressive testing machine. This photo shows the team testing at 18 by 30 inch, 36 inch cylinder in compression. Also in the concrete laboratory were large capacity floor scales for weighing concrete materials and a 300 pound universal testing machine that 300,000 pound, excuse me, universal testing uh, machine on which the majority of concrete specimens were tested. The custom house also housed a cement laboratory. This is the cementitious powder that's used in concrete. Specimens were fabricated and physical testing such as time of set was performed here. The next is the chemical laboratory, which also contained petrographic studies of aggregate and concrete. The paint laboratory conducted acceptance and investigation tests for metal coatings and concrete curing compounds. Reclamation laboratories would not be complete without the shops, which included a machine shop, special instrument shop, a tin shop, a carpenter shop, and a supply room. The concrete materials laboratory contained geotechnical equipment, including the triaxial shear machine, the labs designed and built this machine to determine the angle of friction and cohesion of soils. The custom house also fabricated plaster scaled models of dams and other features. This model of the Boulder Dam is currently in the TSC laboratory in building 56 today. The new custom house had much more space available and reclamation personnel at the Fort Collins lab were gradually moved back to Denver. In the fall of 1938, Reclamation discontinued operations in the Fort Collins Laboratory. Next, I want to highlight some of the other field laboratories and their contributions to Reclamation. This photo shows a valve test stand that was constructed on the Arizona side of the Canyon Wall outlet at Boulder Dam. This innovative stand allowed for the high head testing of the new valve designs prior to installation. Grand Coulee also helped with some hydraulic modeling. This is a photo of the Vista Park model at Grand Coulee Dam that was constructed in 1943. This model remained in place and became a display after the testing was completed. In the later part of 1946, 
the hydraulic laboratory moved to its present location in building 56 at the Denver Federal Center. This is a photo of the entrance to the new engineering laboratory at the Denver Federal Center in 1946. The new location once housed the Remington Arms buildings of the former Denver Ordin Ordinance Plant. Inside, here's some pictures of the hydraulic laboratory, which looks fairly similar to what it does today. During the 1950s and the 1970s, the laboratory was busy with building and testing hydraulic models when dam building was at its most active period in the United States. Over a span of a couple years, the equipment and laboratory facilities were installed that were unequaled at the time. This resulted in a world-renowned laboratory that ensured that Reclamation would remain a leader in materials and hydraulic testing. Installation of the 5 million pound testing machine allowed the laboratory to test specimens proportional to the size of our structures. This testing machine is used today and is the pride and joy of the Technical Service Center. Here's three more photos of the testing of um, the use of the 5 million pound testing machine, basically around the 1949. This is a reclamation postcard from 1950s that shows the 5 million pound universal testing machine and its equipment controls. Then and now. Fortunately, we have been updated. Soon after the installation of the 5 million pound testing machine, the Engineering Center had a dedication in an open house for two days in July of 1950. This is an image of the program and the floor plan of the facilities with the dedication ceremonies. Of course, we had several 5 million pound testing machine demonstrations and over 120 exhibits open to the public. The new laboratory also contained office space in addition to the shops and storage space. The concrete laboratory is similar to what it looks like today. There is a photo of uh, grinding and polishing 10 inch and 22 inch diameter concrete cores we believe are from Shasta Dam. This photo shows the sawing of a 22 inch diameter concrete core from Shasta Dam using the 36 inch diameter diamond saw that is still in use today. Reclamation specimens are known for being large. The new facility allowed access of flat, large flatbed trucks to deliver samples to be tested. In this photo, engineers test methods of jointing 27 inch pipe together for the Central Valley project. Air void content is important for concrete durability. This photo shows a method of determining air void parameters for a hardened concrete. This machine was in use in our laboratory until just a few years ago. Fortunately, computer analysis has taken over the place of painfully counting air bubbles. The laboratory was a one stop shop and it, equ it was equipped to conduct physical, chemical, petrographic investigations of all concrete materials. Moving over to the hydraulic side of the laboratory, these photos show a familiar site of engineers evaluating the performance of physical model and discussing what possible changes they should make. Two control panels direct the flow of the 250,000 gallons of water available to be used in the hydraulic models. As mentioned, the chemical lab was the location of the petrographic examinations of concrete and aggregate, and we believe this photo is of the differential thermal analysis, analysis apparatus also housed in the chemical laboratory. At times, metallic ma materials were tested under extreme heat or using X-ray um, diffraction, as in this photo of an engineer mounting a sample of cement for analysis. Next, I wanna focus on the many innovations of the Denver Reclamation Laboratories. There's two significant innovations related to the durability of concrete that are, are and they are the use of fly ash and the use of air entrainment. The use of fly ash in making concrete has been explored and developed in the concrete laboratory since the 1940s. 
Fly ash is a byproduct of the burning of coal in power plants and was used as early as 1942 at the Hoover Dam on a repair. And its first major use was in the construction of Hungry Horse Dam in 1948. At first, the use of fly ash as a replacement to a small percentage of cement had a cost savings and it helped the heat of hydration, kept it lower. Later, it was found that fly ash also improved workability, increased strength, increased concrete durability, and in other words, what started out as an equivalent of, say, oatmeal in your meatloaf became as great as sliced bread. The next is the use of air entrainment in concrete. In 1946, Reclamation did an extensive durability study and found that adding surfactants to concrete to entrain microscopic bubbles led to concrete resistance to damage from severe weather. This became a major game changer and for our concrete structures and has contributed to the concrete lasting for over 80 years in harsh environments. As mentioned, Reclamation was a pioneer in concrete and materials testing and quality control. One of the greatest contributions to the testing of materials is the publication of the Concrete and the Earth Manual. These two documents have gained worldwide acceptance and have been translated into three languages, Italian, Japanese, and Spanish. Today, most of the reclamation material tests in the manual have been adopted by ASTM, the American Society for Testing and Materials. Also shown here is the Reclamation Guide to Concrete Repair, also widely accepted in the concrete repair industry and a, valu and a valuable guide for maintaining the life of our many concrete structures in reclamation's inventory. Next, Roller Compacted Concrete, or RCC, also makes the short list of valuable contributions of the Reclamation Laboratory. RCC is one of the newest materials in the concrete industry and is defined by as a zero slump concrete normally used in construction because of its ease and speed of placement and low cementitious content, which makes it durable and economical building material. Upper Stillwater Dam was the first dam of its size in the world to use roller compacted concrete in 1982. Next, I wanna highlight reclamation, Reclamation's contributions to high head gates and valves. Even before the beginning of the laboratory, Reclamation engineers were making innovative designs become reality. As taller and larger dams become reality, the need for high head outlet works of large capacities became a necessity. In the early 1900s, reclamation engineers had to be innovative as well. The INSEN valve was invented by two clever refinements. The cylinder gate was made into the first needle type valve to open and close by controlled manipulation of the water pressure from the reservoir. The design was created by O.H. Ensign in 1906, the chief electrical engineer of the Bureau of Reclamation or USGS at the time. The model was built and tested at the Roosevelt Dam in 1906 that led to the design and manufacturing of larger size valves. Another other reclamation design credits include the refined needle valve, the tube valve, the hollow jet valve, the hooded fixed cone valve. These model tests continued for many years once the laboratory was established, both in the lab and at field sites. Over the next several decades, but especially in the period of the 1940s, many new innovative designs were modeled, tested, and prototypes were built and installed. Additional reclamation design credits include, but not limited to the jet flow gate, multi-ported sleeve valves, and the clamshell gate. Aeration slots for tunnel spillways is another significant innovation I want to mention. Tunnel spillways were effective at moving high energy flow downstream away from the dam's foundation. However, the profile of the spillway was subject to cavitation damage. Damage first occurred at Hoover Dam in 1941. The holes were then filled and brought back up to grade. 
Model studies in 1945 looked at aerating the flow at Hooper, but the results seemed infeasible. Damage originally thought to be just maybe due to a misalignment. When damage occurred also at Yellowtail Dam in 1967, engineers realized they had a problem. Laboratory studies had shown that even small amounts of air introduced into the flow would protect the flow surfaces from cavitation damage. In the laboratory, a ramp was devised to test the theory of aeration slots in the aeration slots in the prevention of cavitation. Model studies guided the design and the prototype test measured the effectiveness of the aeration slots. After obtaining this knowledge, more damage was predicted at many other reclamation tunnel spillways, including Glen Canyon. And in 1983, the critical flow conditions were achieved at Glen Canyon and unfortunately substantial damage occurred. Next, I would like to mention some more recent awards the laboratory recognitions related to the Ecological Laboratory, one of the reclamation's newest laboratory. In 2002, Deborah Eberts and Cornell University received a patent for the weevil diet that dramatically increased the growth of these insects to help control the purple loose strife. This saved the PM region significant amount of money each year. Deborah Eberts was recognized the following year as Reclamation's Researcher of the Year. Next, in 2007, scientists took a lead at developing new methods of early detection of invasive species in reclamation facilities. Denise Hosler in 2011 and TSC's Research Detection Laboratory for Exotic Species received the Colorado Governor's Award for High Impact Research in the recognition of their advances in early detection of invasive mussels. In 2012, Fred Nibbling received the Reclamation's Meritus Service Award in recognition for his work with invasive species, partly the zebra and the quagla mussels. In 2017, Sherry Pucciarelli received the Reclamation Science and Technology Research Project of the Year Award for her project of controlling invasive mussel biofiling of hydropower cooling systems using hydro optic ultraviolet light. Next, I want to mention the laboratory programs, which allow reclamation to be a leader in the industry and encourage school age children to consider science and engineering professions. The first is the annual Colorado High School Bridge Building Contest. For 54 years, students have participated in the annual Colorado High School Bridge Building Contest held in the Building 56 Laboratory, even last year when the event was held 100% virtual. As a side note, Fred Travers was awarded the General Palmer Award in 2015 for his work in these competitions. Fred and his family had made the Technical Service Center event first class. This slide showcases the winner of the 50th annual bridge building contest and the large mounted poster for the event in 2017. In 2015, the 45th annual bridge building contest, TSC was recognized for their superior support and teamwork. Reclamation has been a leader of the bridge building contest from 1967 to the present day, 2021. Here are some additional photos and posters from the past bridge building contest events. The next annual event is the Take Your Sons and Daughters to Work Day. This event started out as a guided tour for school age children and then progressed to an open house event at our reclamation facilities once this, our families grew out of the size of the guided tours. This was a great opportunity for our children to see the many great projects of the work that their parents, their aunts, their uncles, or even grandparents worked on at Reclamation. During the open house events, staff and their families were supplied with a map of the laboratory and the different exhibits noted. 
Children carried around a passport and filled them with unique stickers from each of the exhibits. Cindy Gray also provided them an activity coloring book that they could bring home as a souvenir from coming to work with their family member. The grand finale was breaking the two foot by four foot concrete cylinder in the five million pound universal testing machine. The Technical Service Laboratory also offers a large variety of schools and workshops. One of the basic principles is the development. Um, one is basic principles and developments in flow measurements. This three day workshop presents flow measurements, concepts, devices and instrumentation for use in irrigation delivery and drainage systems. The coatings and corrosion school is also a three day course designed to familiarize participants with the issues related to corrosion and corrosion protection of metals and concrete. This focuses on the protective coatings and cathodic protection. The concrete and concrete repair school presents concrete technology and concrete repair techniques specific to features and problems seen within reclamation. Participants will have a hands-on experience with materials used such as chemical and mineral admixtures and standard and non-standard mater uh, repair materials. Continuing with our laboratory schools and workshops, I need to mention the concrete special inspector certification. This course provides an opportunity to train reclamation inspection staff to the highest industry standard. This includes training of sampling and testing of freshly mixed concrete, conveying, placing, consolidation, and finishing concrete, as well as jointing, curing, and protecting of concrete. This course also covers plans reading and provides information on formwork, installation and removal, reinforcements and embedments. The Earth School is an intensive training class which offers hands-on training on a visual identification of soils using the Unified Soils Classification System, laboratory and field soils testing methods, geologic logging, and common earthwork construction testing methods. This class has a strong emphasis on the technical details of identifying and classifying soil samples. A team of well-qualified reclamation specialists lead this training session. And third is the Modern Methods of Canal Operation and Control is a five-day workshop in the Bureau of Reclamation Hydraulics Laboratory. This class educates canal operators, water masters, and engineers on the modern methods for improving and the operations of canal based water delivery systems. This workshop utilizes a small scale canal model and has been described as the flight simulator of canal operators. Complete with water level and flow measurement instruments, remote operated and automated gates and simple SCADA system with human machine interface HMI. Next, I want to highlight the organizational changes of the laboratories throughout the years. In 1954, the organize, organization chart of the engineering laboratories looked like this. There was four divisions. There was the hydraulic laboratory, which consisted of hydraulic structures, hydraulic equipment, hydraulic investigations, and then the concrete laboratory, which consisted of concrete materials and concrete and structural investigations. The earth laboratory had two groups separated between con compacted earth materials and natural earth materials. And then last was the chemical engineering lab, which included chemical analysis, special techniques, bituminous materials, protective coatings and special investigations. In 1967, the laboratories reorganized with more of a focus on research. The hydraulics branch included model studies and special investigations. The concrete and structural branch stayed much the same with concrete materials and concrete structural investigations. The chemical engineering branch consisted of chemistry and water quality, applied physics, bituminous and petrochemical materials, and protective coatings. And then the water conservation branch included groups focused on the evaporation reduction and water quality 
The electric power branch included field investigations and special studies. Soil engineering branch focused on earth embankments, earth foundations, backfill for structures and special investigations. And last, but certainly not least, was the supporting services branch, which consists of research coordination, budget control, and supporting shops. In 1979, the Division of Research and Laboratory Services was reorganized again, this time into six different branches. We had the hydraulics, the concrete and structural, the applied science branch, which was just a combination of the chemical lab and the water conservation branches, then the electrical power branch, soils engineering branch, and the laboratory shops. In 1981, Denver laboratories celebrated their 50 year anniversary and again of course they had an open house on December 3rd. A dinner and presentations were given the night before at the Regency in Denver and the open house included 41 exhibits and demonstrations and you said it, a, always a concrete break in the five million pound testing machine. This is the floor plan of the lab showing the 41 exhibits and demonstrations for the open house celebration. We have a selection of photos from this time frame in history that gives you an idea of what possibly could have been on display during the open house. In the stash of historical documents, we came across these entertaining sketches by Jim of uh, the Italiano from March 1981. We thought these were extremely creative and showed the focus areas of the concrete laboratory at the time. Here's a second set, including the air and training agent, the water reducing agent, the concrete manual training and roller compacted concrete. Whoops, went a little too fast there. And then we progressed to 1994 and another reorganization into five new divisions this time. And this is now the newly created Technical Service Center. At this point in the organization, the laboratory groups were spread out between the different divisions. We had the Civil Engineering Services Division, the Environmental Resources Division, Geotechnical Services Division, Infrastructure Services Division, and the Water Resources Division, Resource Services Division. In 2005, the Hydraulic Laboratory celebrated 75 years with an open house of the laboratory, showcasing the history of the laboratory at its time. Here is a selection of photos from this open house. Many of these showcases are on display even today. Which brings us to the Technical Service Center laboratories as we're organized today. We currently have eight separate laboratories. Three of the laboratory components are within other divisions. The Civil Engineering Division, which has the Water Treatment Laboratory. The Water Environment and Ecosystems Division, which supports the Fisheries and Wildlife Resources Group and the electrical and mechanical engineering, which supports the hydropower diagnostics and SCADA group. The last division, the engineering services and laboratory division houses the remaining laboratory groups, consisting of the concrete and structural laboratory, materials and corrosion laboratory, geotechnical laboratory and field support, hydraulic investigations and laboratory services, and the ecological research laboratory. Next, I have a few slides highlighting each of our laboratory groups that we can assist in our clients' needs. The Water Treatment Group provides engineering and research services for the treatment of contaminated water supplies, wastewater, hazardous and industrial waste streams, and agricultural drainage. The group combines a multidiscipline expertise of chemical, environmental, and mechanical engineers to develop a comprehensive water treatment solution. 
The Fisheries and Wildlife Resource Group conducts investigations to understand and develop technologies to reduce impacts, sustain and improve aquatic and terrestrial wildlife communities associated with the Reclamation's water development facilities and operations. The group has technical specialists in fisheries and wildlife biology and NEPA specialists, which provide information for reclamation to maintain water and power deliveries in an environmentally sound manner. The Hydropower Diagnostics and SCADA group performs a wide range of electrical hydropower and technical services, including on-site technical assistance, diagnostics, troubleshooting, failure investigation, and inspection. This group also maintains extensive power electronics controls and computer laboratories and research facilities, which enable the group to support project needs in an efficient, cost-effective manner. The Hydro Power Diagnostics and SCADA group also offers programs, consultation, training, unique in-house support services, power system studies, and design and installation support for plant supervisory control data acquisition or SCADA systems. The Concrete and Structural Laboratory provides specialized expertise on engineering materials used to build reclamation facilities with an emphasis on concrete materials. This group houses the world-renowned laboratory testing facilities, as well as supports extensive field testing and repair capabilities. Materials and Corrosion Laboratory offers expertise in engineering materials selection with an emphasis on corrosion control. The group inspects, designs, specifies, and, and field tests corrosion mitigation systems, including protective coatings and cathodic protection. They have a competency for non-metallic materials, such as composites and geosynthetics, and environmental compliance and management. The laboratory houses extensive testing capabilities for assessing the interaction of material within its service environment. The Geotechnical Laboratory and Field Support Group includes a variety of services related to soil and rock materials used in reclamation structures. These include both laboratory and field investigations of the engineering properties of soil and rock including in situ soil and rock testing, as well as groundwater investigations. They also offer ex expertise in geological photography, providing assistance in reevaluating materials in solving problems related to design, construction, and research. The hydraulic investigations and laboratory staff members apply hydraulic modeling, analysis, and field testing expertise to solve a variety of water resources, hydraulics, and fluid mechanic problems. The work is focused on ensuring the safety of reclamation dams, managing and conserving water resources, constructing and operating the main and maintaining essential infrastructure and prevent protecting and improving the environment. Last but not least is the Ecological Research Laboratory. Services include the environmental monitoring and research, species identification and genetic analysis, integrated pest management, revegetation studies, and invasive species studies. And finally, in closing, it has been an honor to present the history of the Denver Reclamation Laboratories and who worked extremely worked and the work of the extremely talented engineers, scientists, carpenters, technicians, and administrative staff that collaborated daily and have made Reclamation Laboratories the leader of their industries. And thank you. Now I'll turn this presentation back over to Andy, who's been looking at any questions that may have been provided. Thank you, thank Janet, you, Janet, for, for a wonderful presentation. Um, I really enjoyed it. I'm going to hit your folks up for some of your um, historic images for my own collection. I, I saw some things I hadn't seen before. Um, so as Janet mentioned, this is our question and answer period. Um, you know, right now we um, 
Uh, we had we had a we had a call out for Colorado State University with a go Rams and a thank you for sharing our rich history and that our le our legacy is our strength and shows our can do spirit. Um, so if you all have any other questions um, regarding the presentation, we are open to them. Um, but this is pretty much all we have right now. So we'll give them a couple seconds to see if anybody um, has any questions. And and it doesn't look like we're getting any, Janet. You're off the hook today, it looks like. Once again, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, you can, I think you can, uh, for those of you who haven't who can't haven't seen this presentation, you can click on the invite and it will it, it will be shown back up to you. So uh, on behalf of everybody, on behalf of Janet, once again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and we hope you enjoyed uh, the presentation.